Dr. Thomas J. Ord, thanks so much for joining us on A Pastor and a Philosopher Walk Into a Bar. Hey, thanks so much for the invitation. Absolutely. So can you just tell our listeners, Tom, just a little bit about who you are, what you do, what your background, that whole thing? Okay. Uh, I uh, direct a doctoral program in open and relational theology at Northwind Theological Seminary. But I've been teaching uh, undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral students for, uh, let's see, 25 years, uh, mostly in theology, but some in philosophy. And uh, I've been an ordained elder in the Church of the Nazarene for 30 plus years and part-time pastor and some, well, actually full-time pastor and part-time pastor, depending on the stage of life I was in. I'm married and have three daughters who are now out of the house and on their own and a couple grandkids. Wow. All right. Um, what is open and relational theology? Open and relational theology is a kind of a broad umbrella under which lie a diverse set of ideas, movements, and people, but they share in common two big beliefs. One, that God is relational in the sense of giving and receiving, affecting creation and being affected. Uh, so in other words, it denies uh, what in classical theism is called impassibility. And the open view or the open word stands for the idea that God moves through time into an open and yet to be determined future. So open and relational uh, theologians reject not only the classic view of predestination, but also the classic view of exhaustive divine foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. The future is open even for God. So you're friends with Greg Boyd. Greg <laughs> is a good friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I used to be an open theist. Kyle currently is. I'm whatever yeah we this is not the podcast for that but eventually no. we should talk him back yeah into we it. should It'd be fun <laughs> both let's have an altar call at the end of this podcast <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so the book you wrote recently is and I'm, i hope i get the last word right um the whole time i'm reading the book I'm, it's one of those things where you're hoping that you're getting the pronunciation right and we'll find <laughs> right out. yeah yeah but, but you did like very specifically spell out the pronunciation at one yes. point, which was really nice <laughs> so why don't you just tell me how to pronounce it before i butcher it <laughs> i love it mm. sounds good the book is called the death of omnipotence and the birth of omnipotence omnipotence all right i was close go. yeah i was close so the death of omnipotence that right there will catch a lot of readers and listeners in their tracks and say, well, what is he talking about that? I, I, I was taught my whole life that God is omnipotent. God is all powerful. Um, but the, you're literally the first sentence of the book. You say um, the words omnipotence and omnipotent are not in the Bible. Can you explain that for our listeners who have not yet read your book and go in? Yep. Just the translations, all the business. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think some people who might respond to my claim that omnipotent isn't in the Bible, they might say, OK, well, the actual word is not there. But I've read the Hebrew scriptures, the Greek scriptures, the Old New Testaments, and occasionally you'll find the word God Almighty there. So Almighty is there. And what I show in this chapter is that two Hebrew words have been mistranslated in English as Almighty. One word is the word Shaddai, which biblical scholars say is better understood as breasts or mountains. So it's God of breasts or God of the mountains. And the other word is Sabaoth, which means hosts or armies or group or council. And so when it's preceded by a word for God, Adonai, El, Elohim, etc., it means the Lord of hosts. Both of those words, if you're reading just your English Bible and you come across the phrase, at least in the Old Testament, the phrase Almighty, God Almighty, it's one of those two words that is translated Almighty. The problem came or the mistranslation began uh, in uh, the second and third centuries BCE when some um, Greek Jews decided to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. And made some translation decisions on El Shaddai or Shaddai and Sabaoth. They translated both of those words as the Greek word pantocrator. Panto meaning all, crater meaning something like holding. So God is the all holding one, maybe all sustaining. Um, but it doesn't mean omnipotent even in the Greek there. 
Then when we get to the New Testament, that word pantocrator shows up just 10 times in the whole New Testament. And those are, anytime you see the word almighty in the New Testament, that's, it's derived from that pantocrator word. Um, nine of those times are in the book of Revelation. The other time Paul is quoting the Septuagint in Corinthians. And then in about the sixth century, uh, after scripture is written, Jerome translates the Greek scriptures into Latin. And when he comes across Pantocrator, which again is a mistranslation of Shaddai and Sabaoth, he uses the Latin word omnipotens, omnipotence. And that's the word you'll find in the Latin versions of the creeds, like the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, etc. Um, and so when we say God is omnipotent, uh, we can thank Jerome in his translation. We shouldn't set, think it's in the Greek or Hebrew scriptures. So that point, for one thing, just like filled me with awe because I never really thought through what, how, I mean, obviously Jerome is a hugely important person in church history, but just how important, you know, like you get one word wrong with, if, if you're Jerome, who's translating the Vulgate into the, a readable translation for normal people, you get one word wrong and a whole misconception can happen. So that's a wild thing about this, the idea of biblical translations that we can get into later. But when you say Shaddai, I just want to get over the whole breast thing. When you say Shaddai is the God of breasts or the God of mountains, that's a metaphorical language, right? What, what is, what do you think the Hebrew scriptures are trying to convey when they say I'm El Shaddai? Well, the biblical scholars that I um, reference in the book and the, the ones that I know, I'm not saying I only choose some, but the biblical scholars who write on this, uh, and if you look in the context in which Shaddai shows up, it has something to do with nourishment or fertility. Yeah. And so uh, when you see El Shaddai, it's usually about, you know, uh, sustaining, nourishing, um, you know, life -giving. I, I'm trying to think of an, yeah, life giving, that sort of thing. And then less often is it related to mountains. But the reason that Hebrew scholars oftentimes associate Shaddai and mountains is that the word for mountains in Hebrew is Sadu, S-A-D-U, which is similar to Shaddai. And um, that has more of connotations of protection rather, you know, obviously breasts are sometimes thought of as mountains, but it's more about protection than nourishment there. Mm -hmm. And as we're talking, I hope the, if there's anyone listening who, um, this phrase is in your wheelhouse. The Bible is clear. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're listening. You realize we're talking about an ancient set of, you know, collection of books that were written in ancient, almost dead languages that we're still trying to interpret to this day. That's been translated many, many times. Saying the Bible is clear is a little misleading. Um, <laughs> yep. so, the, so omnipotence, this idea of omnipotence is not in the Bible. That's what you say. That's what I'm saying. And I should be clear that the word omnipotent or omnipotence can have various meanings. And in this book, I uh, choose the three meanings that I think are by far the most prevalent in not only popular way of talking about omnipotence, but also scholarly views of omnipotence. And that is omnipotence either means God is literally exerting all the power, or it means God can do absolutely anything or it means God can control others, other creatures or situations. So controlling, able to do anything, or exerting all power. And I'm saying that these words that have been translated almighty and omnipotent in the Hebrew and Greek scriptures don't mean any of those three. Mm -hmm. So one more question before I let Kyle rattle off a few questions. But your issue with the idea of God, the omnipotence of God or the supposed omnipotence of God, is it rooted more in biblical scholarship? Is it rooted more in the, in theological ways or is it in philosophical ways or all three? Well, you know, it's been a journey for me trying to figure out these things. I guess it's, I get, most people can say that. And for most people, it's some concern in their life, some question they have that gets them to start probing these things. And for me, it was the problem of evil. It was suffering. It was, if God's really loving and omnipotent, then why doesn't God stop the crap that happens to me and to people in the world that seems pointless, unnecessary? Why doesn't God prevent genuine evil if God's omnipotent and loving? That's initially, you know, 30 some years ago, 
what got me started to thinking about a different way of thinking of God's power that, I mean, I've, my, my intellectual journey has taken lots of twists and turns, like I'm guessing most people's have, but that probably was the, the primary concern at the start. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That's really good. We've kind of mapped an outline of where I wanted the conversation to go already. Anyway, I want to talk about the Bible. I want to talk about notions of omnipotence and why you don't get them right. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted to talk about uh, the problem of evil. So this, and maybe a couple other things, but that's, that's kind of good the point. So good. We have a roadmap. Um, before I get into those though, I forgot to ask you, we feature alcohol on our show and I don't know if, uh, if you're a drinker, if there's anything that you love well, drinking at the you know, I'm about. from the holiness tradition. And when that means we're, we don't drink alcohol. I'm drinking plain old water. Oh, tonight, so, so sorry bummer. about that. <laughs> <laughs> Here, actually, we're drinking water right now too. Um, <laughs> we always usually ask at the beginning. So I wanted to make sure. We had the opportunity. Okay. Um, so on the Bible, um, I'm glad Randy brought that up because, and this is going to tell you something about me, I suppose, and where I'm coming from and how I'm probably different from your target audience that whole first chapter for me it's not like um i didn't find it interesting but i definitely like sped up the audiobook <laughs> a little bit to get, to get i love it um, because the objection to omnipotence that it's not in the bible just strikes me as a little odd because i kind of took that for granted um or at least i i do now i take it to be relatively clear that the concept is not primarily or at all rooted in the bible that it comes from anselm and from greek philosophy before anselm um so yeah, so maybe that reveals something, one, about me, but also about your target audience. So, like, who are you primarily writing this book to? Because, you know, all the philosophers that I've talked to and read about omnipotence probably wouldn't be that interested in the biblical case. And so, yeah, who, who's your who's your target audience? Who do you expect to pick this up? Yeah, I, I expect people to read this who are probably interested in big questions, maybe have some uh, education, whether it's philosophical or theological. But, you know, this book, unlike a lot of books I write, this book is really for movements rather than for nicely intertwined set of chapters. You know, the first one is Bible. The second one is philosophy. The third one is the existential or evidential issues of evil. The last one is my constructive alternative. So, I mean, obviously there's some inter overlap, but um, I don't expect that first chapter to appeal to people who are steeped in philosophy. But I do expect a lot of people who take the Bible as uh, some kind of, they'll say authoritative, however they understand that word. I do think it will um, be an eye opener for many of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think so too. And it would be super valuable for, for people in that, in that boat to start with that chapter. So it totally makes sense to me. Um, <clears throat> so let me start by saying, before I launch into some more critical things, <laughs> let me start by saying, I really appreciate your work. And I'm, I'm oh, sad that you. this is the first full length book of yours that I've read, but I've had many of your books on my list for a long time. Um, it's just that when I discovered you, I was in grad school and had no time to read anything. I love it. Yeah. I've been meaning to for a long time. And the first time I, I found out about who you were and looked at the stuff that you had written, I thought, shit, this guy has written all the books I wanted to write. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but particularly the stuff on love uh, mm. and, and how that seems to be the defining core of your work. I really appreciate yeah. it. I love oh, the idea you. of omnipotence. Um, I think it's, beautiful and in some ways obviously true <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks kyle yeah and and that's going to be true even while i'm disagreeing with you about omnipotence <laughs> so just <laughs> okay <laughs> carry that through and also my friend uh chris Lilly told me that i hope he's okay with me sharing this but he told me that one of the first papers he ever presented at a conference you were uh, commenting on and he okay. was a really green grad student and you were an established scholar and that you were super generous and kind to him and so Thank you for being kind to my friend. And I appreciate uh, your focus. Yeah. You get down to the, the, the <laughs> critique. Now. Yes, I'm doing that thing I tell my students to do when they're, when they're engaging in potentially difficult conversations. <laughs> you say some really nice things first. Okay, so um, first just say what omnipotence is and why you think it's a better way of understanding what God is and how it's different from omnipotence. And then I'll have some follow-ups. Yeah, so... Omnipotence is a word that I coined. That's why you don't quite, you haven't heard it and have a hard time saying it. 
And it's doing several things. It's saying that conceptually, philosophically, we should understand God's power in terms of what it means to love. Not only God's power, but all of God's attributes. So we should let love lead in our understanding of who God is and how God acts in the world. And I think love is inherently uncontrolling. So I might put it this way. Omnipotence is the notion that conceptually uncontrolling love comes first among the divine attributes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I make the argument in the book that some people will want to claim that they're trying to give all the divine attributes equal weight. But when you actually dig down into the claims they make, you'll find that one or, or two end up dominating or you, they end up conceiving the rest of the attributes in light of that one, at least if it's a coherent theology. Obviously, you could have an incoherent theology, but um, and often sovereignty is the one that really leads. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Who was it that said something like, I'm going to butcher the quote, but something like there's like a lot of attributes of God that are like descriptions of him or uh, things that are said of God in, in the scriptures, but only one that is identified with God. And that is. Love. Uh, Wolfhard Ponenberg said something like that, but he identified two of them, love oh, really? and spirit. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. I don't know. If spirit, maybe you're yeah. thinking of somebody else, but that's one person I know who said that. I mean, yeah. Brad Jersek says, and I think he's quoting Maximus, the confessor, that God is love plus nothing, mm -hmm. that all mm -hmm. of God's holiness flows out of his love. All of God's power flows out of his love. All of God's knowledge flows out of his love. Um, mm. Yeah. Which I like. That's a, yeah, it's a really old idea. Okay. Yeah, some people will say to me, oh, you talk so much about God's love. What about the other attributes? As if I don't think God knows something or is present or whatever. I, you know, I affirm the other attributes. I'm just saying we get ourselves in conceptual problems when we define the other attributes and they conflict with love. Yes. I think we ought to have love be the thing that uh, is our overarching norm. Good. So it's not the omni aspect of the attributes that you have issues with. It's only insofar as they conflict with the love aspect. Is that right? Right. A good example would be omnipresence. I affirm that one. You know, I don't really like the word omnibenevolent because it sounds like God is all giving, but not all receiving. And I have a receptive view aspect of love. So it, that's just a, tech, a terminological <laughs> quibble there. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And maybe we should just say Omni just means all for listeners who aren't familiar with that lingo. Okay. So um, I had a question about omnipresence. Maybe we'll get to it. I don't know. I, I, I okay. wonder if some of your objections to omnipotence would also apply to the others, but, but we'll see. Um, okay. So you discuss, as you said, three notions of omnipotence in the book. So I want to press you on why you chose these rather than some others. Mm. Uh, so maybe it's the audience. So if, if, if that's the answer, fine. Um, so Again, you're talking to a philosophy podcast, so it might yeah. be a little different than your target audience. So yeah. God, God exerts all power, which as far as I can tell, tell is just occasionalism, maybe, um, which is a philosophical position I can explain if needed, but it's one that's almost universally rejected by philosophers and always has been. That's like not a, a recent thing, always has been. I did once hear Alvin Planning argue in defense of it, but he, he was almost joking. Yeah, I know some philosophers who defend occasionalism. So <laughs> anyway. Tiny, <laughs> tiny minority. <laughs> Yeah, they're in the minority. I definitely agree with that. Like, yeah. oh, is this real? So it uh, also depends on the version of occasionalism. Like there's one version I could actually embrace. But anyway, we'll, we'll okay. get into the details. <laughs> anyway, God exerts all power. It, basically, occasionalism is the idea that the only uh, causally efficacious uh, force or power, the only real cause is God. Like humans don't do anything. Right. Uh, so God can do anything. That's the second notion. Uh and then God controls. That's the third. Yeah. None of these seem to me like defensible, like prima facie anyway, none of these seem to me like defensible notions of omnipotence. Um, now, I agree that they're commonly held by lay people. They're commonly preached from the pulpit. They're common misunderstandings of what people read in the Bible. So I'm fine writing a book attacking them. Um, but your book kind of comes across like it's doing a little more than that, like it's making a philosophical case. And if it doesn't mention the strongest forms, then it seems a little like what I tell my students not to do, <laughs> right? Which is, uh, like out a, you know, less than the strongest version of a thing to critique. Um, so why not, well, well, two things before I, before I 
ask you about the ones that I think are better definitions. Um, is your primary charge against omnipotence that it's incoherent? And if that's not your primary charge, how is it distinct from that charge? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, my primary charge against omnipotence in this chapter on philosophy is that in order to make sense of the dominant views of omnipotence, it has to be qualified in so many ways that, as the title of the chapter says, it dies a death of a thousand qualifications. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you, you're you're criticizing me for setting up weak versions of omnipotence, and um, I I don't think that's uh, that. Well, that's, how should I put this? Um, I'm quoting Augustine and Thomas Aquinas often in these sections. So like they're pretty major figures. Yeah. Now yeah. I do at the end, and actually I did cut a section in which I take some contemporary philosophers of re religion who use, you know, modal logic and all these sort of technical little things, which I think illustrates really nicely my overall claim that they're qualifying it in a thousand ways to try to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. um, so if your criticism is I'm not taking, um, oh, I don't know, Wes Morriston's mm -hmm. view of omnipotence and since it, those of you know, don't know him, he's not very well known, but he's a contemporary philosopher. I'm not taking his and then criticizing it. Then I think, you know, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But of course, Wes Morrison, I think, agrees a lot with me. So he's not a good example. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe, well, even someone like Eugen uh, Nagasawa, you know, he's got his maximal God thesis. I'm in agreement with that, but he doesn't have to have omnipotence in any of the senses or in, I'm not even sure in any sense. Um, well, actually, I am confident he doesn't have to have omnipotence in any of the standard meanings of the word yeah. to have a maximal God thesis. Okay. So is the outcome of, I'm going to ask you about the qualifications thing in a minute, but is okay. the outcome of that argument that the concept is just incoherent? If you, if you have it's, to qualify. It's incoherent. So like, yeah. 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 Yeah, I guess I'm saying it's incoherent without qualifications, and then there are so many qualifications that I yeah. think it's a it's a fruitless exercise. So, would you say that there's something you can arrive at that might be coherent, but it's not theologically useful? Um. Yeah, it's probably possible, but the literally thousands and millions of qualifications you'd have to get to to make it coherent it seems to me again like a fruitless exercise okay that's helpful <laughs> so here are some ideas of uh, some notions of coherence that they're all kind of similar but they're i think distinct god can do anything that is possible and moral god has the power to do anything god wills to do that is logically consistent can I can I critique these? Do we on, go through, give, or is these? I can give you four, okay. and then you can critique them. Okay, let me let me get my pin out here. <laughs> <laughs> He'll go through them again. He's actually Tom. getting his pin. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I am. <laughs> this is great. All right, go for it. All right, one was God can do anything that is possible and moral. Two is God has the power to do anything God wills to do that is logically consistent. Three, God is maximally powerful. And four, and this one comes from my dissertation director. <laughs> Not like he's ever going to listen. Who's that? To. Uh, Mike Reen. He uh, published a paper a few years ago just called okay. Omnipotence in the International Journal of Philosophy Religion. Um, and this is, he, he, you'd probably like it. He goes through a bunch of different notions, describing the problems with each one, uh, and finally lands on one that he thinks is uh, defensible. And he gives a very long and uh, logically rigorous statement of it that I will not bore you with, but the the uh, gist is a being is omnipotent if and only if the only limitations on its powers are imposed by metaphysical impossibility. And the only limitations on its capabilities are due to the possession of other positive character traits. Very similar to the previous ones, really. He's just cashing it out in more specific terms. All of those strike me as perfectly coherent ideas. I might I don't know if I'd go so far as to say they're theologically useful ideas. We could have a conversation about that. But they are, seemingly to me anyway, intuitive consequences of the the basic idea of what a God would be. So I guess I'm kind of in, in Selmian in that way, and we can talk about that. 
Um, but yeah, I don't. I, none of those no, really come up in the book, and they're what I take to be just they're the definite the basic definition of omnipotence that I give to my students in philosophy one hundred and one. So, yeah, I think, what do you think most of these come up in the book, maybe not quite the way you do it. First of all, you say God can do anything that's possible and moral. Yeah. I helped my granddaughter feed the ducks yesterday. Yeah. I put little pieces of bread in my fingers and we gave it to the ducks. Mm -hmm. God doesn't have fingers. How do you it's know? A moral I can thing. have fingers if God wanted to have fingers. <laughs> Not according Jesus, to the tradition. God's Jesus a finger. Remember in the book, I spend a whole section on God being an incorporeal spirit. Yeah. So we have to choose here. Either God's incorporeal and is a universal spirit or God has a body. Or God's a shapeshifter. I mean, there's some other options you could, yeah. God could zap into being, but then, and that creates all kinds of other problems. Yeah. So if there's lots of things. In some way metaphysically impossible for God, then it would just be excluded from the definition. But it's metaphysically possible for me. Sure. And you're, that first one was, is possible and moral. So I'm saying I there are things that are moral for me to do. That there shouldn't be anything I can do that God couldn't. I'm sorry, what was that again? I wouldn't take omnipotence to imply that there shouldn't be anything that a creature could do that God couldn't do. That that wouldn't be part of the definition, I wouldn't think, not an intuitive part of it anyway. There's lots of things I can do that God can't do that aren't like speaking against his capacities. Yeah, we agree on that. It's just the way you said that first one sounded like God can do anything that's possible and moral. And mm -hmm. I said, I can do things that are possible and moral that God can't do. So I disagree with that one. Second one, you said omnipotence can be something like, and I couldn't write it down fast enough, but it was something like God wills to do that, which is logically possible or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the book, I really criticize this particular, at least what I think is what you're saying here. Um, I criticize this as people saying, well, God can do anything God wants to do. Mm -hmm. And then they take off the table all of these things that God wouldn't want to do because God knows they're metaphysically impossible. <laughs> so like, you know, God wouldn't want to stop existing because God knows it's metaphysically impossible. Sure. So I think this second one is hollow. It's meaningless. It's vacuous. It's saying God just, God can do what God wants to do. And that's just a tautology. <laughs> Third one, I'm perfectly on board with number three. I wonder that's, about that. Yeah, that's where I do at the end of some of that section, I talk about maximally powerful. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm totally on board with that. I just think the word omnipotent doesn't usually mean maximally powerful. I think it means some of those other things. So, so the, thumbs up on number three. I don't want to like belabor the point, but literally I went to, because I was curious. And when I read that section of the book, I was like, well, he's using maximal power here as like a, yeah. one of the entailments of omnipotence and like, isn't that just what omnipotence is? So I went to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on omnipotence to see what they said. And literally the first sentence is omnipotence is maximal power. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Yeah. I also say it at the end of that philosophy chapter, though, too. Um, if you take a look at that, I'm quoting Eugen there. And um, I don't develop it like I do in omnipotence either. So, um, yeah. So, so oh, hey, yes, I'm on board that. with that one. Yeah. What was that? I'm sorry. We're agreed on that one, at least. I just think that yeah. is omnipotence. <laughs> and the last one, metaphysically impossible, given God's character traits or something like that. Again, I couldn't write it down fast enough. Yeah, um, so the only limitations I'm, on God's powers are imposed by metaphysical impossibility or by a, you know his possession of some kind of positive character trait. I'm totally on board on that. Okay. Most of my books have been endorsing that position, and I think omnipotence is that position. Okay, interesting. Okay, good. So a lot of this, I think, comes down to semantics then, which I don't know yeah, if I'm yeah, happy or I sad so. about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have this one view that I call essential kenosis that's making a claim about uh, God can't go against God's nature, and so it's these certain characteristics. And then, right. You know, like most philosophers, I don't think God can do the metaphysically impossible. So, Good. yeah. Yes, I remember yeah, so. Richard Swinburne saying one time, and I'm not endorsing Richard Swinburne, so don't write me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, something like, um, he was talking about that phrase, he was talking about Aquinas specifically, but that phrase, can God make a rock so heavy that he can't lift it, which annoys the piss out of me. But anyway, he, yeah. he, like, you know, the way he cashed it out was a phrase that sounds like it's saying something meaningful turns out to not be saying anything meaningful. So it's not so much uh, pointing out 
some weakness in God's nature or God's power, as it is pointing out a weakness in the ability of a human sentence to express a clear concept. Yeah, I think that's really important. I also think that last one, which is the one I've put a lot of my time into, and I personally think it's the most important of those four that you gave me, um, because it has actual teeth to it. It has it's making certain claims about the divine character and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot more going on there than what is that what the simple fl- phrase you gave to me connotes to most people. Right. That, yeah. that, uh, so I think, for instance, you have to make all kinds of conjecture and claim about what God's nature is like and what God's moral capacities and characteristics are like. And people are going to have different intuitions about that. And so, um, and so while I definitely strongly agree with that and I've tried to develop it, um, it's not as clear cut, I think, uh, as it might seem at, on the face of it. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Randy, why don't you ask something non-philosophical before I keep <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like what you said. I like your pushback. Thank you. Don't, don't be us. There's more Tom. to come. come yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 it's, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm going to bring it back down to earth a little bit. Um, okay. I, in reading your book, I took your book as somewhat of an exercise in making many Christians who say and believe problematic things about God aware of the problematic things that they say about God, whether it's... <laughs> That's most control. of my books, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Uh, whether it's saying, oh, well, God is in control, or God can do whatever God wants to do, or um it's a god thing right let's that's one of my favorite favorite ones. there's all these things in their field in our liturgy in our in our in our in our especially in our common modern day worship songs it's just all this stuff about god being all powerful and doing whatever he wants so am i right in saying that it seems like it's kind of trying to speak to christians who say problematic things and believe problematic things and then the main question is how damaging do you think our platitudes about God's power and control are, whether they're found in worship songs or just common conversation? Yeah, I I think, yes, you're getting me. A lot of my, when I'm writing this, I'm thinking about Christians um, who say things that drive me bananas. Yep. (laughs) Um, And I address this a lot in chapter three of the book, especially in terms of the problem of evil. And in this book, more than any other, I really criticize liturgies and worship and not just contemporary praise rock and roll but the hymns of the church as well i think they've set up christians to expect god to do things that god in my view simply can't do Mm -hmm. and because of that people are disappointed in god and rightly so (laughs) if they're told over and over in the hymns and the liturgy that god can rescue them and god doesn't rescue them then they they ought to be pissed and angry and disappointed and hurt when they're not rescued Mm -hmm. um so yeah i'm i'm taking pretty direct aim on the life of the church and the liturgy and the music and what the harm that it can do to people um I think often people who write that stuff have good motives, but um, yeah, it has, it can damage. Yeah. And I mean, how much, as we think about it, or as we talk about it, how much more memorable is a good hook of a song, whether it's an, you know, 200 year old hymn or a modern day contemporary worship song where you're talking about God being in control or God being all powerful or God, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. You yep. remember that, and that forms our theology much more than a five-point sermon that lasts 40 minutes that we really don't remember much of. Yeah. Isn't that a shame, though, Randy? You put all that work into that sermon, and oh, people yeah, don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, t- I totally think that's right. And I think, you know, people, again, I think the motives behind those things are usually pure. People want to give hope. Folks are suffering. They're confused. They live in a world that hurts them. They're harmed. And you want to comfort someone. And it seems in the moment, it's comfortable to say, oh, God's in control. This is all part of God's plan. You know, God's doing this for a purpose. Or God allowed this to build your character, to draw you closer to him. All those kinds of things. Again, people usually have good motives. But that's the number one reason atheists say they can't believe in God. And that is the problem of evil. I, I mean, pastorally, I've, I know in my, you know, in my 
view way too many people who have fallen away from the faith. And what I find oftentimes is that what people tell people who are grieving, who have lost, primarily who have lost someone or whose child has terminal cancer, whatever it is, the things that we tell people in their grief in order to help them make, make them feel better are the things that a year down the road erode their faith into nothing because they mm. say, well, if God was in control, what the hell was, why did my child die? Or if right. God can do anything, why, why did my dad die? We fill in the blank. I've seen that multiple times where the stuff that we think is actually going to comfort actually dis is destructive to their faith. Yep. I totally agree with you. And I see it too. Yeah. Yeah. I used to also tell my students that a good, when we talked about theodicy, that I, I think a good rule of thumb kind of test for a theodicy is, would you say this to your best friend if they were in deep suffering? <laughs> and yeah. Was, no, maybe yeah. rethink it. Um, yeah. So, well, you know, I, I quote that, that line that I've, has rung in my ears for decades since I've, I first read it from uh, Irving Greenberg. I think it is, you know, no theology is plausible. that can't be said in the presence of burning children. You know, that's, yeah, that's a, that's, there's a litmus test for you. <laughs> yes. And I, I want to come back to this, uh, this evil topic and get you to explain how your view helps with it. Um, okay, great. So, Time back in. Thanks for <laughs> back, 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 to, back to the quibble. I think you're welcome for saying understandable words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. Okay, so this I is wanna... good for me, you know, because like I've been a philosopher and a pastor. I teach theology. The ideal and... guest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Actually, when I was writing this book, I was thinking, you know. I my background suits me to write this book. I mean, I don't know Hebrew. I took some Hebrew, but I forgot it. But I still remember my Greek pretty well. And so I've had a history of biblical studies, but I'm also a philosopher and I do theology. And so anyway. Yeah. Yep. So, <clears throat> okay. Quibble number two. <laughs> Good. Um, dun, 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 dun. So you say something in the book that seems a little misleading to me. I don't know. We'll see what you think. Um, okay. so talk about the thousands of qualifications. You said it here too. Mm -hmm. Thousands of qualifications of omnipotence. Uh, you know, it dies the death of a thousand qualifications, as the old phrase says. But you really only point out a handful of qualifications. Uh, and point out quite a few. Nothing, nothing dies the death of a handful of qualifications. <laughs> and the, the particularly <laughs> misleading part is uh, like you, you point out several types of qualifications. Right. Yes. And they're all like very well uh philosophically you know beaten to death <laughs> types yeah. of qualifications yeah. and i counted at the end of that chapter maybe five or six types um but you know some of the types have an infinite number of instances right so like yeah. the uh the mathematical qualifications on god he can't make two plus two equal five uh literally an infinite amount yeah of instances yeah. but it's still one qualification right uh, and so if we just are okay with the idea that god can't do mathematically impossible things moving on yeah um, so so there's that um and it seems to me you 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 get a lot out of that in yeah. the book um or you yeah. try to so like um the objection at the the end of that chapter i think this is chapter two about the number of qualifications you give an example about all glorious idaho which was really funny um, you say the place can't be all glorious if there are thousands of ways it's not. So you, you get a lot of mileage out of that thousands thing. But there's nothing intrinsically undermining about the number of qualifications. Uh, surely what matters is whether there's a coherent idea after the qualifications, which is kind of what I was getting at earlier. Um, and it seems to me also any concept has a potentially infinite number of qualifications if we're just counting possible instances of exceptions to the concept. Yeah, so you got it's several like objections of... there. Yeah, yeah, several objections. See if I can remember to respond to them. First of all, you're right. I'm talking about millions and billions of qualifications, but they're really under a category of maybe six or seven general categories. Yeah. Um, um, so I, I don't know if that's if I'm apologizing or I'm just admitting, yeah, uh, you can categorize these things under on these general stuff. I do think of all those general categories, um, things that God can't do because of God's nature. Um, you, in that earlier quote, you talked about God's uh, character traits. Yeah. Um, I think those are often overlooked by many people. Um, 
and they need to be emphasized and they're pretty interesting. But the one that I think gets probably my, my only really novel contribution in this chapter, I'm mostly just reporting what lots of philosophers already know in this chapter. My novel contribution, I think, is the incorporeality issue. That's not, at least in my reading of the literature and philosophical literature, that's not oftentimes emphasized. Mm-hmm. I found one quote from Charles Tull- Taliaferro, or however you say his name, mm-hmm. um, to that regard. But I think that's a crucial one, because in the questions of theodicy, oftentimes the analogy is made, well, I could save my daughter before she walked into the street. Why can't God? Right. And my answer is because God doesn't have a body like you don't. And so then we start playing out all the things God can't do because God doesn't have a div- localized divine body. Then I think that's a radical move. I think that's a game changer. At least it has been for people who have read my work over the last, I don't know, eight or 10 years when I've been talking about this, mm-hmm. because they've they've wanted to make the analogy, which I think is a good one, that God is like a loving parent all on board with that. And then they say, yeah, but parents, they sometimes stop their kids from, you know, shooting themselves if they're able to, why doesn't God and, um, spelling out all of the qualifications to divine power that come from saying God is an incorporeal universal spirit, I think is, uh, pretty significant. So while it may be in one subsection of one category (laughs) i think that's a pretty big deal um the other thing uh, i forgot now all of what you said except one deal and that is you rightly said that every word requires some kind of qualification right yeah if i say a book they say which book what the what's the size of the book etc so yeah that's right but what i think is unique about omnipotence is that for many people, it connotes lack of qualifications, omnipotent, right. able to do anything. Yeah. So as I point out in the in the book, it's ironic that the word, at least for many people, think lim- or qual- without qualification or limitless requires, you know, so many count, uh, qualifications and limitations to make sense. So I think the word is unique in that sense. Yeah. Good. So, yeah, if, if the, the thrust of that section of the book was mostly like informing people about what philosophers have actually thought about omnipotence, then I'm right there. Yeah. On board. Like, I think, yeah. <laughs> uh, our, I think Aquinas has a, a section in his Summa titled something along the lines of how an all powerful God is unable to do many things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I quote, I quote Thomas a lot in that section. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Back, though, to one of the my qualms with your list of four things, uh, it bugs the heck out of me when people say God can do anything God wants to do, because I just think that's empty puff. I think it ultimately is relying upon claims about what God's smart enough not to do, those things God knows God can't do. And yeah. people who say that are just kind of trying to sound like they've got this really strong and God who really is, they're not really saying anything substantial. Interesting. I pulled that from a philosopher. I can't remember the name of the, okay. the person at, at the moment, but I guess I just read it as consistent with the other claim about character. God is limited by God's desires, which are limited by God's character. Yeah, but you know, the the debates between the voluntarist and the essentialist about whether or not God can make choices about God's character. So, yeah. you know, if you're a voluntarist and you think God can choose not to love, then you're going to answer that differently about what God chooses to do and not chooses to do than if you're like me, who's an essentialist. So anyway, we're quibbling again, but, or maybe not quibbling. We're getting into the weeds that probably a lot of your this listeners. This is maybe the weediest episode we've had in a while, and I'm really... <laughs> <laughs> no apologies, Randy. Would you no. like to <laughs> interject anything? <laughs> Keep geeking out. Dude. You okay. have a great listener base. If they can, well, we'll this. see how it goes. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't quite tested them. Uh, but, yeah, try to keep it yeah, fairly accessible. So, let's talk about evil because that's that's coming. Good. Up. So give give us your. I guess I could say your theodicy, but like your your yeah. explanation of how omnipotence 
helps with the yeah. problem of evil. And you also, I want to get you to comment on one thing you say. You say the traditional soul building and greater good theodicies can be salvaged if we detach them from omnipotence. Uh, which, so it sounds like you you think there's something valuable in those. Yep. So my general theodicy says God is uh, all loving, but this love cannot control anyone or anything because God loves everyone or and everything. So this is not a voluntary divine self-limitation that you'll find fairly common in con many contemporary theologians. This is a limitation based upon God's very character, which gets back to our earlier conversation. Excuse me. I like to uh, compare my position to two positions that are adjacent. Maybe we'll call them on the left and the right. My view says God can't do control others because controlling others is contrary to the divine nature. That's that essential kenosis language I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And on one side of me are those people who say God usually won't or chooses not to control situations and context, but God could if God wanted to. And maybe God will occasionally do so to do a miracle, resurrect Jesus, create the universe, whatever. So the voluntary self-limitation position suffers the problem of, you know, if God can do it one time or if God can do it at all, why doesn't God step in to help the rape victim or whatever? Mm -hmm. On the other side of me are some people who at least give the impression that God is truly limited, but there's some sort of external forces, factors, powers, be they natural laws, metaphysical laws, principalities and powers, Satan or whatever. So there's something outside of God limiting what God can do. My position says it's God's very nature that places limits upon what God can do, and that nature is chiefly uncontrolling love. So it's not the case that God chooses not to intervene to help some person about ready to go into a car wreck, but God simply can't do that. And add to that the notion that God's an incorporeal spirit without a localized divine body. God doesn't literally have a hand to stop a rock or whatever. Yeah. So that's my general theodicy. And then what I did in the third chapter of this book, um, because I've written on theodicy in several other books, I decided, you know, let me take my six big ideas that I think together actually solve the problem of evil, not just a defense, give an actual solution to the problem of evil. And let me see if I can run kind of some of the traditional attempts to do theodicy in light of those six and take out omnipotence. So one of them is the soul building theodicy that is made fa probably most famous in 20th century by John Hick, that every evil that happens in the world is at least allowed, if not caused, but at least allowed by God to, for some greater good. Usually he says it in terms of building character, but you could have a, a more universal notion there. So I say, well, you know, there's something right about that in the sense that, yeah, sometimes our characters are built built because we suffer, but it's also true that they're not always. And sometimes things happen that seems to make the world worse than it might have been. If we take out omnipotence, we can affirm what's good about the soul building, but not say that God had the power to stop the bad thing. Rather say that God is working with whatever happens to try to bring something good out of the bad God didn't want and couldn't stop in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, do you want me to talk about all six of those ideas? No, or no. What do you think? Let me, <laughs> let yeah. me ask a quick question, Tom, for, for those who are listening and who are like, well, what about what the Bible says? So let me just give some examples. Cause Hey, we had the Bible in chapter one. Come on now, know, Randy. Not, <laughs> not done, not done. Uh, you, you said uh, um, two minutes ago, something like, well, God does can't stop the rock from falling on that person because God doesn't have a hand yeah. to stop it. But let's just take the Exodus story, for example. Like yeah. there's many things that God does. It claims an Exodus supernaturally without God having a body to actually do it, turning the Nile River into blood or making water come out of a rock or making locusts appear out of thin air or um, parting the Red Sea. God doesn't have a body or, you know, mechanism to do that. It just happens yeah. because God wills it to. How do you how does that like God doesn't have a body to stop a girl from getting hit by a car jive with God can part a, an ocean for his people? 
Yeah, I love that you inserted a little phrase in there that I think most people would insert that I don't think the Bible requires. You said, because God wills it to. Yeah. Which I think you're saying God can alone decide something that will happen. The The phrase I like to use is God single-handedly brings about some result. Mm-hmm. The claim I make in that Bible chapter, after I look at the Greek and Hebrew words and all that sort of stuff, is that the miracles that happen in scripture happen because of either creaturely contra- uh, cooperation or conducive conditions amongst the um, you know inanimate conditions of creation. In other words, the Bible doesn't require us to think that God single-handedly parted the Red Sea, single-handedly brought water out of the rock, single-handedly yada, yada, yada. Um, now, some of those things may be legends. I'm not saying every single you know, story in the Bible actually happened, but my theory works if they all actually happen. Um, I just don't require that from my theory. So um, what I'm trying to say then is that we can affirm what scholars, biblical scholars would call the mighty acts of God and the miracles in scripture uh, in my view, so long as we say there was some kind of creaturely contribution or cooperation to make those things happen. And the big upside of my view, I think, well, there's lots of upsides, but one of the biggest ones is that it then solves the question of why God doesn't do a bunch of miracles, why Jesus can't do miracles in his hometown, why he doesn't heal everybody all the time, why you and I go to the altar at our church and we pray for our grandmother to get over cancer and our grandmother dies, what I call the problem of selective miracles, because then we don't have to think that God can single-handedly do whatever. We can say there has to be the conducive conditions of creation or some kind of cooperation for the miracle to happen. Yeah. So what we were just saying made me think of a question that I didn't think I was going to ask because it, it seems a little, uh, I don't know, uh, silly, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Okay. And I'm going to make it a Patreon extra. This is the thing we like to do sometimes. Is oh, okay. Our, our Patreon supporters, we throw in a question that only they get to hear the answer to. So here's the question. Uh, how is God on your conception different from a sufficiently advanced alien species? Uh, if you want to <laughs> hear the answer to that question, uh, become a Patreon subscriber. Um, so, but for real, it's a real question. because That's a good teaser. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's, well, one, I'm just a sci-fi fan. And so I, I, yeah. I was always a big fan of Q and Star Trek. I don't know if you ever watched Star Trek, but yeah. uh, seemingly omnipotent alien species, right? Because they just happen to be uh, birthed around the beginning of the universe. And so they've mastered uh, all the technology that's conceivable. And so to us would appear as deities. Um, but they're of yeah. course omnipotent and they didn't create the universe. They're, they're coextensive with it. Um, so yeah, if, cause you, you're a kind of a process theologian, right? You, you deny, um, I've creation. definitely been influenced by process thought. Yeah. Right. So you deny creation ex nihilo, which means that's right. Yeah. God didn't just God is, uh, et- eternal, right? I don't know if you'd say the universe is eternal or not, but at least God I would not, no, did no. not, uh, pull the universe out of nothingness. Correct. Uh, yeah. And so, and God in some sense needs the universe, I think, right? Um, and so if God is not omnipotent in the more traditional sense, then I, how is God different from our perspective from an alien? How do we know God's not an alien? Yeah. Well, uh, I take it that an alien is a creature, and I take it that creatures can't be omnipresent because I think by definition, creature is not if if a creature could be omnipresent then then we are starting to see some similarities between creatures and god i let also me, let me take it real quick so one of the other things richard swinburne said was uh, and i know i'm quoting this guy i really don't think <laughs> he's, a hey, he's an open theist at least problematic <laughs> figure, guys i realize it. there's four people who are listening who knows who that is right, well, the right. <laughs> please don't google it for the rest of you. Oh, i love it they so, couldn't Go ahead. But, but, you know, the way he explains omnipresence is God is present by his causal powers at every location. I agree with that. His knowledge and his causal powers. Any alien species, Q could do that. Oh, I don't think that's correct. Yeah, I guess maybe I have you certain a stable views. wormhole, you're omnipresent. What it, is there such a thing as being outside the wormhole? 
Sure. As far as I understand Einsteinian physics, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So maybe instead of saying these things uh, your alien can do and these things God can do, maybe I'll say uh, this is what I think God can do and this is what I think no creature could do. <laughs> so I don't think any creature is omnipresent. I don't think any creature knows everything knowable. I don't think any creature is perfectly loving. I don't think any creature is literally everlasting. So um, if there's a creature who has all those characteristics, I'd say, well, you're just talking about God. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, but you know, you know, the little G more trick here. Uh, one, one philosopher's modus ponens is another philosopher's modus tollens. <laughs> but like you would say, you're just talking about God. And I'd say you're just talking about aliens. <laughs> <laughs> Very, you know, that's fair. I mean, I do think this is, brings up a, a really important question, and that is, uh, in what ways are is God like creatures, and what ways is God different? And you know, from there are some philosophers who want to make so, God so totally different from creatures. They're what I call absolute apophatic thinkers mm -hmm. that it seems to me you don't have anything at the end of the day that constructive. All they want to talk about is what God is not like. And I do not advocate that approach. On the other hand, there are some people who I think make God too much like creatures. Uh, this is one of my ongoing criticisms of my Mormon friends. Um, you know, that God actually does have a body in the LDS tradition with God actually does have a penis in the LDS tradition. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we all have to make choices in our theological construction about similarities and differences between creatures and creator. Um, and, you know, my set of choices might be different from the next person's. Yeah. I'm trusting if anyone actually did pay money to hear the answer to that question, they're geeky enough to enjoy it. Yeah. I really <laughs> <appreciate> <laughs> All right, let's oh, bring it. Let's it. bring it back in. Um, okay. Let, yeah, you just a real simple question, Tom. Um, okay. You reference Augustine many, many times in the book, for good reason, because a lot of our understanding and concept of omnipotence comes from Augustine. Uh, you don't seem to have a deep and abiding love for Saint Augustine. <laughs> so, can you just Dude. tell us what your thoughts are on Augustine and what your thoughts are on his influence in Christian Western theology? I think Augustine is the worst, most influential theologian in the history of Christianity. How's right. that? <laughs> I right. think he's the worst in terms of not just the set of ideas, but the influence his ideas has had. There's people who had worse ideas than him, but his influence of those bad ideas has been the most prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, I think he tries to connect certain categories of perfection related to immutability, impassibility, aseity, uh, simplicity that not only don't fit scripture well, but they don't even fit our ontology of what it means to be a loving person well. And he screws up love massively. I spent two chapters in a pluriform love book talking about all the ways uh, Augustine screws up the love language. And then that's handed down in the tradition um, yeah, I don't have much good to say about Augustine, although he did have some interesting things to say about politics. Um, but I think, yeah, we used to say when I was in uh, undergraduate, you can call him Augustine or you can say Augustine, but either way you say his name, his theology is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I was shaking his head. Gross. <laughs> Yeah, I'm no bad poetry for defender, the podcast. But I am a defender of bad takes on Augustine, <laughs> or, or sorry, an attacker of those. Uh, okay, um, yeah. So I I do want to come back to the the evil question. Just to ask one one follow up, and that okay. is, do you think God will eventually overcome evil? And if so, how does Great. that work? Yeah, on, on your view. So I have a view that I call the relentless love theory. It says that God never, ever controls in this life or the next. God works with all creation capable of response to God. And because God's love is literally relentless and everlasting, there's the hope that God overcomes evil, but that requires creaturely cooperation. So I don't have the kind of guarantee that could only come if you have a God who has that kind of omnipotence that I'm rejecting. 
Of course, if you affirm that, then you all the other bad things we've been mentioning comes along with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to offer a, a coherent and rationally consistent eschatology as well. Yeah. So, but in, but on your view, it might not work out. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. I really appreciate the honesty of that. It deeply bothers me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I me too. I, I hope it deeply bothers you. Um, I don't know yeah. if I can call that being God. Um, but so I really appreciate yeah. the honesty. So I was, yeah. to be honest with you, I was looking ahead to the last question that I was going to ask and didn't hear the part where you said it might not end up good. Um, how, how do you, how do you, how do you think your way through that when you have first Corinthians 15, that says that God is going to be all in all and accomplish ultimate victory. The book of revelation is kind of clear about God. Uh, yeah. It's not clear about anything, Randy, but, yeah. but like, yeah, I'm, that was going to be my response. About anything, I would say it's, it's <laughs> that God has final victory over evil and injustice and oppression and all the things. Um, yeah, I don't think the Bible is clear about that. I don't think the Bible gives us a clear eschatology. I do think it gives us hints of something like a victory. So, you know, I, I get that. But, you know, you, what, what, we so all you, know that. Biblical so, you know, First Corinthians 15, then when Paul says um, Jesus is going to have authority over all things, all things in heaven and on earth. And he's going to hand over the keys of the kingdom when he has take, taken his seat and rule over all things. And then God will be all in all in that. What do you think that Paul meant by that? Well, I think God is all in all right now in the sense that God is omnipresent and influencing all things. So there's a number of ways, maybe that I should have began. There's a number of ways you could translate or interpret all in all. But I think that Paul is presenting a future hope. I mean, that's uh, hope is a really big category for Paul. Mm -hmm. And hope in my way of thinking is different from absolute certainty. So it seems to me that even Paul has an eschatological hope that doesn't uh, require us to be 100% certain things are going to work out. Yes, no. I mean, we can't be. Yeah. So um, my view of things provides the real possibility and uh, of all things being reconciled, to use the Pauline language. Mm -hmm. um, but it just doesn't say it's going to happen through omnipotence. Sure. I was... I was, you know, this was probably, well, not this was probably, this was the kind of final issue for me to work through in my theology, my eschatology, because of the worries that you both have and are, are voicing here. Because I want a God who can guarantee things work out well in the end. Yeah. But if I have that kind of God, then I've got a God who's responsible for not stopping evil right here and right now. Sure. or at least not creating things right in the first place. Anyway, you got all kinds of problems. One thing that really helped me uh, was a sermon by John Wesley. Hmm. He's, uh, he's kind of contemplating eschatology, the animals, whether or not they get in the afterlife, and, and whether or not, he says, he contemplates whether God can irresistibly, so that's a kind of control, irresistibly bring all things and then he kind of sets that aside, said, no, God's not in the business of irresistible. God's in the business of love. And then he says this line that's been helpful. He says, it's as easy for God to save a world than it is one soul. Hmm. And I thought, and that's in the context of him saying that salvation is never unilateral. There's a symbiotic, there's a creaturely response to salvation. So I thought to myself, look, Tom, if you think God is saving you, and you're responding to God, why be pessimistic that God can't convince the rest of creation to say yes? It's not a guarantee, mm -hmm. but if you think that God is working in your life and you're experiencing the salvation as you respond to God's call to love, then you got lots of confidence that others, and unless, unless you know, I'm the only great person in the world, but I don't think that's the case. I think I'm just as guilty as others and I'm trying to live a moral life and develop habits. And I think that's possible for everybody. So anyway, that was really helpful for me. Got it. Yeah, that's good. I love the theme and we don't have to go into it because you've been going into it a little bit, but I love the theme that you kind of wrapped up the book when you talk about amipotence. I, I don't know how to say that word, um, <laughs> but this theme of God being this collaborative, cooperative force in the universe that cooperates and collaborates with human beings to accomplish God's desires and will and in goodness. The idea that God is a God of love and 
that love invites cooperation and this sort of synergy or symbiosis between God and creation. Mm -hmm. That's an idea that is um, increasing in popularity, especially in the academy, uh, because we have a sense that we have agency and that our lives matter in some way. The problem, I think, is that most theologians who say we can participate in what God's doing retain a view of omnipotence that says, even if we don't participate, God's got the kind of power to guarantee things are going to work out anyway. Mm -hmm. The view I'm putting on the table says, nope, what you and I choose really does matter. Mm -hmm. We can screw it up. Now that's going to make some people feel really nervous, <laughs> but other people are going to say, yeah, finally a theology that fits my lived experience because I think my choices do matter. And because God never gives up, then there's the possibility that I and all creation will eventually say yes to God moment by moment. And we'll have that universal reconciliation, but God's not going to force me. I have to actually choose to cooperate. That's a difference of my view when it comes to God's love and power than a lot of other theologians. Yep. Yes. And amen. You landed it perfectly for us, Tom. Thanks. <laughs> We're going to talk again in a couple of days about a book that you and your daughter edited about uh, your tradition, the Church of the Nazarene, and why you think it should be affirming of LGBTQ queer people. And um, we're excited to talk about yeah. that as well. Yeah. Excellent. I'm looking forward to it. I had so many more questions and objections. So that's just uh, <laughs> evidence that we need to continue the conversation. Just have good. I like it. Yeah. Because we didn't even get, we didn't scratch the surface. So no, but this has really been fun. And I appreciate you um, being a good, good support about some of that. I, I appreciate the opportunity. And, and I, I, this, this is not me just sort of uh, pulling the wool over your eyes. I really look forward to people giving objections. Because um, I'm the kind of person who I want to try to see any weakness in my view so I can try to shore up that weakness. Or if it's really a genuine one, then change my view. <laughs> so I, I look forward to genuine criticisms. Shouldn't awesome. we all be like that? Heck yeah, man. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> awesome. Tom, thanks for joining us. Yeah, you're welcome.